Well, everybody, welcome back to the Bible Breakdown Podcast with your host, Pastor Brandon. Today, Joshua chapter 10, and today's title is just, When God Moves, Expect the Unexpected. There is a miracle that God does in today's text that honestly still confounds people. It is right up there with Jonah getting swallowed by a fish. I know it happened. I got no idea. <laughs> Just speculation. And that's what I love about God's Word is it's always a little deeper than what we can find. We're going to get into that in just a moment. But as always, if you like what we're doing here, make sure you are like, subscribing, sharing the YouTube videos, listening to it on the podcast. You're still my favorites. <laughs> I love you so much. Make sure you're leaving us a five-star review. It really does help us in that search algorithm. And I would love for everybody to go to a Facebook group called Bible Breakdown Discussion. It's kind of a place where no matter how you listen to this, we have people who listen on podcasts, on uh, on Stitcher, and um, oh Lord, I lost the other one, uh, Apple, and the Spotify. There we go, Google. And then we have all the YouTube, all these different people, all these different platforms. And it's one place we can all come together at the Bible Breakdown Discussion on Facebook. And there's some amazing people writing some great devotions that I would love for you to read. They're really empower, empowering and impactful and all the all the good words. You should really enjoy it. Well, as you're getting your NLT Bible ready to Joshua chapter 10, get your cup of coffee ready. Let me catch us up with where we are. The nation of Israel is taking over the promised land. This is a land that had been promised to them ever since they had to leave it because of a famine back way back when. And eventually they end up in Egyptian slavery. They get out of Egyptian slavery. They're supposed to take it over, but they end up in a wilderness for 40 years. Now it's time for conquest. And you can look back in Joshua chapter 1 in the podcast we did on how we can see that this is a righteous and just holy war where they're taking back the land from these belligerent nations who are not willing to understand you've just been written. <laughs> it's time for you to leave, and this is ours. And they've went through all these things. They, they defeated Jericho and they had a snag at AI and they had to repent of some things and they got it right and they did all that. And, and then they had some folks come and, and uh, betray them and deceive them. And so there's all these different things that's happening. But God is still with them and God is still moving in their life. And what I love about this is the whole idea of Joshua is God's promises are faithful. But one of the things we have to realize is that God's promises are not like the get out of jail free card monopoly. And you get that card of Monopoly. If you ever roll a bad, you know, roll and you got to go to jail, you just throw down that card and everything's okay. Well, a lot of times when we go through difficult times, we think that a promise from God's word is like a get out of jail free card. I just quote that verse and everything's okay. Have you ever noticed that it's not okay? <laughs> because God's word always comes with a premise. Like before he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, the first that's uh, Philippians 4.13. The first 12 verses is how he teaches us how God partners with us so that I can do all things. I like to think of the promises of God as God's open doors and God's help to walk through them. God could do it all by himself, but he has chosen. You can see all the way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, where God would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. God is always interested in relationship and partnership. So God's not going to do something for you. He wants to do something with you in your life. And we can see that happening as Joshua and the nation of Israel kind of getting their steam up and they're going through there. So we're going to read today as they're continuing to do all the different things. They're continuing to take over these kingdoms. But there's one moment where sometimes the only way to get a radical answer to a prayer is to pray a radical prayer. And so we're going to see what he prays and God does it. So you ready? One of the craziest miracles you're ever going to see happens in this chapter. Here we go. Verse 1, with a word I can't pronounce, we're going to say the king of Jerusalem is Adonai Zedek. Okay? Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured and completely destroyed Ai and killed its king, just as he had destroyed the town of Jericho and killed its king. So he also learned that the Gibeonites had made peace with Israel and were now their allies. Jokers. <laughs> Verse 2, he and his people became very afraid when they heard of all this because Gibeon was a large town, as large as the royal cities uh, and larger than Ai. And Gibeon were made strong, or were uh, Gibeon, Gibeonite men were strong warriors. So by the way, re remember that at this point, Jerusalem is not part of, of Israel. Okay, they, they, are, they are enemies at this point, the, the people who live there. So King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem sent messengers to several other kings, Ahoram of Hebron, Piram of Jermuth, Jephi of Lachish, Debir of Eglon. 
Come and help me destroy Gibeon, he urged, for they have made peace with Joshua and the people of Israel. So these five Amorite kings combined their armies for, atta- for a unified attack. They moved all their troops into place and attacked Gibeon. The men of Gibeon quickly sent messengers to Joshua at his camp in Gilgal. Don't abandon your servants now, they pleaded. Come at once. Save us. Help us. For all the Amorite kings who live in the hill country have joined forces to attack us. You know that had to be, by the way, a little bit frustrating for Joshua. Because these jokers aren't supposed to be their friends anyway. These are the ones that had deceived them. And now they need help. (laughs) So here we go. Joshua in verse 7. So Joshua and all of his men, including his best warriors, left Gilgal and set out for Gibeon. Do not be afraid of them, the Lord said to Joshua, for I have given you victory over them. Not a single one of them will be able to stand up to you. Joshua traveled all night from Gilgal and took the Amorite armies by surprise. The Lord knew, or excuse me, the Lord threw them into a panic, and the Israelites slaughtered great numbers of them at Gibeon. Then the Israelites chased the enemy along the road of Beth Horon, killing them all along the way to Azka and Makadiah. As the Amorites retreated down the road of Beth Horon, the Lord destroyed them with a terrible hailstorm from heaven and continued until they had reached uh, Hezekiah. The hail killed more of the enemy than the Israelites killed with the sword. On that day, the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites because Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people of Israel, and he said, listen to this, listen to this, let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stayed in its place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. This is an event not, uh, is this event not recorded in a book of Jasher? The sun stayed in the middle of the sky and did not set as on a normal day. There has never been a day like this one before or since when the Lord answered such a prayer. Surely the Lord fought for Israel that day. Then Joshua and the Israelite army returned to their camp at Gilgal. Let's go with the easy ones first, and then we'll go to the hard ones. Uh, The easy one in this section is the book of Jasher. There are a lot of different books that were written during that time, but they were not considered divinely inspired. The book of Jasher would be one, and it would be more of a commentary on the law of Moses and a historical account not considered divinely inspired, even by the Jewish people of today. So there are books like that. There's one called the Book of Jubilees and different ones. There is Even today, there is a commentary to such things called the Midrash and the Talmud. These are just commentaries written on the five books of Moses. So the Book of Jasher was one of those where it chronicled the things that happened. Now, the second one is that it says that this was the only time that this happened in history. So it's a very particular thing. That's good to know because this is downright confusing. (laughs) What happened? And I have heard a lot of people who have got really good explanations. One of the explanations I have heard is that during this time, and there may be some kind of archaeological evidence that can somewhat convey some of this, is that a major comet might have come across the sky, and it would have come across in such a way that it would have looked as though the sun, but from a further distance, shined all through the night. There are some who have said that, and they claim to have some evidence to back that up. Another has said that what might have happened was, is it might have been a lunar eclipse, so that during that evening, the moon was extremely bright and made even more bright because of some different things that was happening. And so the moon was there, but it shined so bright that it looked like the sun. And it might have even been like a blood moon, you know, where the moon looks red, and that might have been the case. I have a problem with that one because... The text says the sun and the moon stayed in place. Can I give you the bottom line of this? I have no idea. (laughs) I have absolutely no idea how this happens. There's a lot of really good reasons and things. And one of the things I love to do is I love to see how God uses nature to do supernatural things. Like there's a lot of evidence that that we could look at and go, yeah, these are ways, these are natural ways, including the idea of the hailstorm that killed a bunch of those jokers. Some have said that may have been a volcano or something like that. The truth of it is, I have no idea. And my faith does not require me to be able to explain how God does things because he's God. My faith doesn't require how people do things because that they're people. But God can do whatever he wants to do. And apparently, one time in history, he decided that he was going to give the nation of Israel some more time. <laughs> so what you got to love is you have to love the raw faith of Joshua. 
Imagine you needed something. And you say, well, you know, God, if you, if you don't mind, could you give me a raise? Could you help me with my kids? Could you do this? When's the last time you said, God, see that sun? Ever since the dawn of creation, you've had that thing spinning in a certain way. You've had the earth spinning in a certain way. Could you stop all of that for a day? <laughs> That is a prayer, my friends, and guess what? Sometimes when you pray a radical prayer and it fits within the purposes of God, God will answer that prayer. So we can pray all we want to. It's when our prayer meets God's plan that miracles happen, and there's an amazing one that happened right there. Verse 16, let's finish this up. During the battle, the five kings escaped and hid in the caves of Mecca, which, by the way, if my enemy's God stops the sun, I'm going to flee and hide in a cave too, all right? Verse 17, when Joshua heard that they had been found, he issued this command. Cover the opening of the cave with large rocks and place guards at the entrance and keep the kings inside. The rest of you, continue chasing the enemy and cut them down from the rear. Don't give them a chance to get back to their towns, for the Lord your God has given you victory over them. So Joshua and the Israelites continue to slaughter and completely crush their enemy. They totally wiped out the five armies except for a tiny remnant that managed to reach their fortified towns. Then the Israelites returned safely to Joshua at the camp of Maccabea. After that, no one dared speak a word against Israel. And Joshua said, Remove the rock covering over the opening of the cave and bring the five kings to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jermoth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they brought them out, Joshua told the commanders of the army, Come and put your feet on the king's necks. So they did as they were told. Don't be afraid or discouraged, Joshua told his men. Be strong and courageous. For the Lord is going to do this to all your enemies. Then Joshua killed each of the five kings and impaled them on five sharpened poles and hung them until evening. As the sun was going down, Joshua gave instructions for their bodies bodies of the kings to be taken down from the poles and thrown into the cave where they had been hiding. They covered the opening of the cave with a pile of large rocks, and it remains to this day. That same day, Joshua captured and destroyed the town of Maccabea. He killed everyone in it, including the king, and left no survivors. He destroyed them all, and he killed the king of Maccabea as he had killed the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all the Israelites of Libna uh, went to Libna and attacked it. There too, the Lord gave them the town victory and gave them the town and its king. He killed everyone in it, leaving no survivors. Then Joshua killed the king of Libna, and he had, as he had killed the king of Jericho. For, from Libna, Joshua and the Israelites went to Lachish and attacked it. Here again, the Lord gave him, them Lachish. Joshua took on the second day, and he killed everyone in it, just as he had done at Libna. During the attack at Lachish, King Horam of Gezer arrived with his army to help defeat the town. But Joshua's men killed him and his army, leaving no survivors. Then Joshua and the Israelite army went on to Egalon and attacked it. They captured it that day and killed everyone in it. He completely destroyed everyone, just as he had done at Lachish. From Egalon, Joshua and the Israelite army went up to Hebron and attacked it. They captured the town and killed everyone in it, including its king, leaving no survivors. They did the same thing to all of its surrounding villages, just as he had done at Iglon, and he completely destroyed the entire population. Joshua and the Israelites turned back and attacked Debir. He captured the town and its king and its surrounding villages. He completely destroyed everyone in it, leaving no survivors. He did to Debir and its king just what he had done at Hebron and Libna and its king. So Joshua conquered the whole region the kings and the people of the hill country, the Negev and the western foothills, and the mountain slopes. He completely destroyed everyone in the land, leaving no survivors, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua slaughtered them from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza and from the region around the town of Goshen up to Gebion. Joshua conquered all these kings and, um, and the land in a single campaign, for the Lord, the God of Israel, was fighting for the people. Then Joshua and the Israelite army returned to their camp at Gilgal, just completely just taking over as they went. And you know what I love about this as we get ready to end our time? Not only did Joshua ask for a great miracle and expect God to do something, but did you notice right there in the middle that when he went there and he got those kings, the the kings that had caused fear in that surrounding area, the kings would have, have had absolute authority. He takes his generals and he tells them what God had told him. God had told him through Moses 
and then told him personally over and over again, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. And now he takes that faith, takes that word, and he passes it on to someone else. Now they're in this moment. They're experiencing this wonderful victory, and he doesn't save it for himself. He takes it, and he passes it on. And I think that would be a wonderful lesson for all of us. When God starts to move, expect the unexpected. And then when God starts to do great things in your life, don't just celebrate it ourselves, but share it with someone else. Take the very word that God uses to bless you and use it to bless someone else. Man, it's amazing to see what God can do. And they're not done yet. They're going to continue. That was one set of armies. I believe it was the southern armies. Now they're about to take on the northern armies tomorrow. But that's enough for today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy. Thank you, God, that we sometimes go through difficult seasons of waiting and repentance and restoration and all of that. And God, sometimes we just go through seasons of victory, seasons when we feel like we're on that gas pedal and things are really going. I pray that in the middle of that, we won't just rejoice for ourselves, but we'll share the things that you are doing to encourage us. We'll share them with others so that others can experience your goodness too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. My prayer for you is that by the end of your journey, just like Joshua, you will say, not a single one of all the good promises that the Lord had given was left unfulfilled. Everything that he had spoken came true. I love you. We're going to take a few moments and reflect on God's word, and I will see you tomorrow for Joshua chapter 11.